Well, listen, if this is your first time at Life's on Church, I just want to welcome you again. Uh, we just have a saying around here. We think Sunday should be the very best day of the week. And we think it should be the best day of the week really for three reasons. The first one is we get a chance to worship God and give Him our best. And aren't you grateful for a worship team that gives you their best every week? Come on. So grateful for what they do and uh, leading us into a place of worship. We get a chance to, to learn from the scriptures, which we're gonna do today. And then we get a chance to do it with people who still are trying to figure out how to walk in the fullness of what God has for us. And that's a lifelong journey, but we're getting, it to, do, we're getting to do that together instead of trying to do it alone, because it's way harder to do it alone. Pastor Paul even spoke about isolation last week a little bit. If you missed that message, please go watch it. It's, it's a good one. And uh, so here's what I'd, I'd like to do. I'd like you to just tell the person beside you, I'm glad we're doing this together. Tell the person, I'm glad we're doing this together. And tell the person on the other side that they can do it on their own. Just You just do it on your own over there. I already got my people. They're on the left. You're on the right. That's how it works. How many of you have ever, have ever, uh, have ever felt stress before? Some of you. A few of you. Some of you never felt stress in your life. You just. How many of you are stressed out having to raise your hand about stress? <laughs> Some of you are, aren't you? Well, let's pray, and then we're going to dive into today's message. Father God, we come to you in Jesus' name. Lord, we're grateful to be in your house today. Lord, I just ask that everything that we do today, all that we say, all that we look at in the Word of God, that you would, uh, God, utilize it to shape us, guide us, mold us, not only make us more um, comfortable in our journey with you, God, because it's not about our comfort, but that it would refine us to be more like you. That, Lord, we would learn how to walk more closely with you. That we would learn how to hear your voice better. That we would, we would walk more in the fullness of what you have for us and what you've laid out for us, God, as, in, as your creation. And so we thank you for that today, Lord. Please, please, please have your way today in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. Amen, amen. Well, here's what I'd like you to do as we get started today. Um, we, every week, we put all of the notes in, a, in, in an app called the YouVersion app. And so you can go right into the YouVersion app and go and open the events section and take notes there. Uh, all the scripture is there. All the blanks are there. You can fill them in. If you don't want to use a digital device, then we would just encourage you to write it down in some way. Ooh, <laughs> that was awesome. Somebody brought like an original Coke bottle. You know what I'm saying? Like a clink, clink, clink. Um, so, uh, so here's the thing, I want you to write it down somehow so you can grab a piece of paper, you can use your neighbor's hand, write it on their hand, whatever you need to do. But uh, I believe that, that every time we gather, there's something God wants to speak to us. And I hear it all the time when I'm standing outside, my wife and I are talking to someone in the four-year-old, they'll say, Pastor David, I felt like you were talking just to me today. And while that makes me feel good, here's the truth of the matter, that, that my responsibility is to tell you what I, what I believe the Lord has put on my heart for our church. And the Holy Spirit does the work of personalizing it to you. He's the one who brings it right to the center of your soul and says, mm, I want to grow you, I want to shape you, I want to encourage you, I want to exhort you. That's his work, it's not my work. My job is to share what the Lord has put on my heart and it's his job to do the work in us by that. So I want his words to be what you hear, not my words. And I want you to be receptive to what he wants to do and, and shape and grow us in personally as well as as a church. And today, in the, as we start a new series, called That's a Good Question. Here's what we're gonna do this week and the next few weeks. We're, we're looking at a few questions that I hear a lot or that our staff pastors hear a lot. People will, will, will make appointments and they'll ask some questions or they'll, they'll ask for some, some pastoral care or some coaching or something. And we hear a lot about uh, this, this topic today. I am just stressed out. Anybody ever use those words? How many ever use those words, right? I, we hear it all the time in this last few years in particular. I'm just stressed out. And, there, and I don't know about you, I'm, just, I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to project this on you. But sometimes when people say that, you're like, you know what? Let's take a minute and compare our stress. <laughs> Anybody ever do that? Let's just, come on, somebody be honest. We're going to be very honest today, all right? Anybody ever do that? Someone says, I'm so stressed. You're like, really? Really? You ain't know nothing about stress. Let me tell you about stress. And we got a little bit of that kind of like, my stress is worse than your stress. We're going to one-up the stress meter. And someone says, well, here's my stress, and, and this is what's stressing me out, or my husband or my wife causes me so much stress, or my boss is just a stress monster. And, and we use all kinds of language in this word stress, and it, it builds up, and it has effects on our body. It has effects on our spirit. It's, it's, it's not a good thing in a macro sense, but it's a very important thing in a micro sense. Some of you are like, did he just say stress is good? Has anybody here ever been to a gym in their life? Okay, 
So if you've been, now those of you that have been to the gym, put your hand back up. If you've ever been to a gym, put your hand back up. All right, now all of you who put your hand up, have you ever lifted weights while you were there? Keep your hand up. Okay, a bunch of hands went down. I'm just, because that's how it works, okay? So yeah, you can put your hands down. Is, some people just go to the gym and they walk through the gym and go, that looks like a good device. <laughs> they walk by the mirror and go, I'm not sure I need it. Ugh, but those are good. And you just go ahead and squat lower over there. And, and then they walk out. Like, <laughs> they didn't do nothing. And if you don't actually go through the stress on your muscle by lifting the weights, the weights don't get any bigger. The muscles, I mean, don't get any bigger. The weights stay the same size. They never grow. But your muscles get no bigger if there's never any stress. So, so some stress is good. Excessive stress is bad. If you put too much weight on the bench, if you put too much weight on the bar, and you try and lift that weight or squat that weight or deadlift that weight, you, you'll pull a muscle. You'll you know, you, you be that guy that's walking out like this after he did it because he wanted to, in some cases, prove they were super strong. In other cases, they didn't know what they were doing, and they got themselves under too much duress. So macro, too much stress, very bad. Micro, you need some stress or you don't grow. So today I want to talk with you a little bit about stress. I want you to write a few things down. Um, first of all, I tweeted this, uh, or put this on Instagram, but t- I-, I was shocked by this. I was reading some statistics on stress and saw this, that about 27% of Americans report that most days they're so stressed out they cannot function. So I just want you to look down your row. Count the people in your row. Go ahead, look down your row. Go ahead, look. No, you got to look at the row, not me. Look down to the left. Look down to the right and just count. One, two, three, four, five, six, two, 17, 13, four. Just count the people. One in four. One in four. Every fourth person in this this poll said, I'm so overstressed, I can't function. That's macro. That's problematic stress. Now, I don't don't know what all of those people's stressors are, but that's their description. So I want to give you, first of all, a little bit of a definition about stress, because it's a big deal. And today, I'm going to try and address some, some of the question of stress, what we do with stress, how we handle stress, what the Bible has, has, has to say about the kind of the, the, the application of or the, the scope of what brings stress uh, with you. But here's the definition, um, and this is a, a friend of mine, Dr. Andy Yarbrough. Here's how he's defined it, psychologist. He says, the soul, the stress is the soul's and body's response to what's changing environmentally and circumstantially. Stress is the soul's and body's response to what's changing environmentally and circumstantially. Medical definition is the state of mental or emotional strain or tension resulting from adverse or very damaging circumstances. Now, stress is different than worry or anxiety. So there is stress, then there's worry. Worry is the dwelling on the negative consequences of the circumstances in our mind. It is putting a a deep attention to the negativity that is that we have perceived or are experiencing in circumstances or environments, and we dwell on it. Everybody say dwell. Dwell. I don't know if you've ever done this. Anybody anybody ever heard somebody say, Yeah, I'm just the worrying mom? Right? Somebody ever heard that or ever said that, right? We say, I'm just the worrying mom, as if it's some badge of honor. My job, whenever my child goes somewhere, is to fret and imagine every terrible circumstance that can come from where they're going, what they're doing, the people they're going to be with. What, like every, I'm just, I figured out every possible problem, and I can do nothing about them. But I'm a worry, as if it's a badge of honor. That's different than stress. The other thing is anxiety. Anxiety uh, is, is this. It's the encompassing of the whole experience, thoughts, emotions, and physicality. And anxiety will often stay even when the environment is changing. Anxiety will remain. Stress gets relieved as circumstances and environments shift. Anxiety actually can, uh, can and often exists even beyond the changing environment or the changing circumstance in our favor. And so stress has both implications and it also has benefit. Uh, what we're not going to talk about is, is benefit because I think you get the concept. It's pretty straightforward. Without some stress, there's no growth, but excessive stress can actually crush us. And so I want to I wanna read you a couple of verses of scripture and then we're going to talk about kind of the three main categories. First of all, I, I think this is one of the, I don't know, the roots or the, the, the baselines. I, 
Many of you know the story of Job in the scriptures. We're not gonna unpack it, but I love verse 25 of the book of Job, chapter nine. It says this, it says, my life, this is Job speaking, my life passes more swiftly than a runner. Anybody ever feel like your life is just passing you by? Like it's just going and going and every day, it's like where did the days go? Where did the years go? My life is passing more swiftly than a runner. It flees away without a glimpse of happiness. Day by day by day, days pass and days pass and days pass and days pass and months pass and months pass. And next thing you know, you're looking back on weeks or months or years and going, where was any happiness? And we would often say joy. Where is any happiness in the days and weeks and months that have passed? Because I felt like my life is racing by. Things are being taken out of the way. I haven't gotten to enjoy any good circumstances. I've only been living in the bad ones. And certainly Job knows all about it. But so does the Apostle Paul. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, this is going to be kind of our baseline for today. We're going to read this together. In fact, if you have your Bible, I would love for you to open it with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And we're going to read this together. So in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, Paul is, this is a portion of Paul's second letter to the church at Corinth. And Paul does a wonderful job through both of his letters of, of leading and coaching and exhorting and the, the church at Corinth. And he speaks to some things out of his personal experience. He addresses some issues in the church, but he's, but he's writing to coach, shape, pastor, care, mentor uh, the church at Corinth. And then he, he talks about kind of his, a little bit of his own reality in 2 Corinthians chapter four. And we're gonna begin reading down in verse 10, uh, excuse me, in verse um, Actually, we'll, we'll begin in verse seven together. We've got a few verses we'll put on screen, but I think it'd be good if, you, if you've opened your Bible, I would hope that you would highlight, circle, underline, star this section. I believe this chapter as a whole will be a massive encouragement to you in the area of dealing with and understanding God's kind of coming alongside us in the journey of attending to or dealing with or overcoming stress. This is verse seven. Paul says, but we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. Verse eight, we are hard, I'm in the, uh, the New International Version. Uh, actually, I'm gonna be in the New Living Translations where I wanna be, so let me change that. There we go. So verse, uh, verse eight, it says, we are pressed on every side by troubles. We are pressed on every side by trouble. Anybody ever felt like that? pressed on every side by trouble. I don't care whether, whether you live in a triangle or a square or a hexagon, every side is getting pressed on. If you live in your own little arena, the whole thing is ringed around you, pressed in upon you. Paul says, but we're not crushed. Look at the person beside you and say, we're not crushed. He says, we are perplexed. That has to do with a mental state. We're, we're uncertain, we have doubt, we have questions. We're, there's difficulty, we're trying to sort through the answer, but we're not driven to despair. We're hunted down. I don't know, anybody in here being hunted down? That sounds like a stressful situation to me. We're hunted down, but never abandoned by God. We get knocked down. I don't know if you've ever been knocked down. Sometimes it feels like circumstances of the world can knock the wind right out of me and I wanna fall down. I feel like I've been punched in the gut, punched in the mouth in a, in a, in a metaphorical way, but sometimes some of you have had experiences where people literally just walked up and just like clocked you and knocked you right down. Paul had some very physical stress put upon him, but we're not destroyed. Verse 10, through suffering, everybody say suffering. And the description there of suffering includes what we would call stress today. Through suffering, our bodies continue to share in the death of Jesus. Uh-huh. Some of you are like, oh, I hate this verse. <laughs> Through suffering, our bodies continue to share in the death of Jesus. But there's a reason. So that the life of Jesus may also be seen in us. Stress is not fun, and there's some things that we need to, can do, should do, need to do. We're going to talk about those, but what we need to understand is that the outworking of what is taking place in us as we go through suffering and being perplexed, being knocked down, being hunted, the things that both bring stress and the definition of stress itself, that reality in us is working things in us like lifting the right amount of weight. And so today, 
I want to talk to you a little bit about motivations, about uh, some, some habits that will help us with stress. And in the U.S., there are really three main categories of stress. There are three main categories. One is um, financial well-being. Like a, the first one is financial well-being. Most people list as one of the most significant stressors in their life is their financial well-being. Do I have enough? Can I get enough? How do I get more? So what, is, what is someone doing to create the fact that my little bit doesn't go as far? It's things like inflation. It's things like um, our, our, our housing, uh, the cost of housing, rents and mortgages and interest rates. It's our retirement accounts. Financial stress is listed by, in almost every poll as one of the, if not the, preeminent stressor in anybody's life. Anybody say amen to that? Okay, we all know financial stress to some degree or to small or, or, or great degrees. Now, the Bible actually speaks to this one a ton, the issue of financial stewardship, a ton. The second one that you've got there is the issue of our, our work life, our work life. It's the idea of stability in our job, having purpose attached to what we give our time to. It's the construct or context for our occupation. Where do we do it? Who do we do it with? And what are we about? That, that speaks to stress on our work life. Anybody have anybody that you work with that sometimes stresses you out? Go ahead. Go ahead. None of my staff raise your hand. Chris, put your hand down. All right. So, right? We, we all know that. There's a relational engagement of stress that is anchored in our workplace. It could be that our job function is, is stressful. There's the nature of some jobs is more stressful than others. So work life is, is the second one. And then the third one is literally just safety, kind of our, our, our how's our, our physical, personal well-being, our family's well-being. It's the issue of economic, socioeconomic upheaval, violence in the streets, crime rates that are going up, law enforcement in, you know, funding that's going down. Like it is, it is legit overwhelming to some people, overwhelming, not just I'm aware of it and it's not good, but it can be stressful to the point of I can't function. The, this is the third area, personal safety. And so I wanna speak to us a little bit based on what Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter four. And here's the first thing I want you to write down. This is really, really important. This has to do with our mind being settled when circumstances aren't always settled. I don't know if you've ever thought about that, but, but when circumstances become like the waves of the ocean and they're up and down and all around, my mind and my motivation get messy. So here's what I want you to write down. Living from a place of clarity about God's direction for your life. Everybody say God's direction. God's direction for your life relieves stress. Living a self-defined destiny is what creates it. The journey of stress relief that, that I think the, the word of God makes clear to us, we're gonna look at a couple of scriptures here, is that m most of us wrestle with the tension, a major tension in our life, is whether or not we're walking in how God has designed us, his purpose and trajectory for our life. Wait, wait, like, am I walking in the way God wants me to walk? Not just like, am I walking, not like just walking the right way, but you know, like Aerosmith, am I walk this way? Is this the way I walk? Am I going, the, is this God's direction for my life? And here's why this is a big deal. Because when we know that we are walking in the direction of what God has ordered our life to be, then even when the waves come or the stress is present or it goes way up, I've got an anchored certainty that if I'm in the direction and will of God in the place that I'm going and the way I'm living, then no matter how bumpy it gets, I have an anchor in a storm. But when I have self-defined the destiny and the direction, say, well, I'm gonna walk this way because I want, insert things here. The direction that we set almost always has to do with self-defined desire. I'm gonna walk this way because I want that girl, that job, that money, that saved. I've decided the best thing for me is this pathway. Then when things get wonky, what does everybody do? God help me! I cry out for the rescue from a pathway I'm on that I defined and ignored what God's best for me might look like. And I thought, I'm gonna go the way I wanna go. It's my life, I'm autonomous, I can define it, I can walk this way. And when it gets messy and broken, because we're gonna hit speed bumps, we live in a cursed earth, 
When the time comes and it gets wonky, I call out to God, God, rescue me. When really, had I just backed up to the place where I took my self-divine path and said, I'm not gonna go in the way I wanna go. I'm gonna trust the pathway that God would lead me. And if he says, walk this way, I'm gonna walk this way. If he says, walk like this, I'm gonna walk like that. If he says, go toward this, I'm gonna go towards that. Because then when I face speed bumps, I can go back and say, Lord, you set me on this trajectory. I don't blame you, but I call upon you to deal with what has come upon me. You have an anchor and a source of strength that you can run back to because you are settled that you are walking in accordance with God's best. The circumstances don't lead you into a place of disrepose. So here's what Hebrews chapter 12, verse one says. I love this verse. It says, so let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And then this, this, this second part of the verse says, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Uh, look at the person beside you and say, don't run my race. Look at the person on the other side of you and say, stay out of my lane. <laughs> the Lord has marked out a race for you to run. He has, he has in his his creation and his sovereignty and his purposes on the earth, he needs you to do what only you can do. He has a direction and a trajectory for you to run in. And when we live in, in the lane that God has called us to run in, it doesn't mean that the stress may not present itself because circumstances do change. Environments aren't, aren't always predictable. But if, 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 I'll, if I'll run the race that's been marked out for me, I know full well that the Lord is both aware of, anticipating, and a part of the solution when those things present itself. I love Psalm 139, verse 16. It says, all the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. So, so here's the deal. This, I, 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 this, is, this is sort of a tense thing to kind of think through here, but the Lord has laid out and ordained not only your days before you, he's marked them out for us, and he has ordained good works that we might walk in them. And the days are all written in his book. But, and, and so people say to me all the time, well, Pastor Davis, how does that work? I thought I had free will. You do. This is the crazy part. And I don't, don't ask me to, to help you fully get it because I think there's some inability for us to fully comprehend. But here's the idea that God has marked out the days for you to walk, but he also knows the days you're gonna choose. So you say, this is the pathway, Lord. And he says, walk this way. And you're walking in his ways. Lord, speak to me. Tell me, am I walking? Is this the direction I should walk? Yes. Oh, it's getting bumpy. He's all right. I got you. And we get up here and it starts to get bumpy again. And we go, okay, it's look stable over here. <laughs> and the Lord, the Lord says, I knew you were going to do that. And then we say things, well, Lord, why did you let me do it? He goes, well, I gave you free will. Yeah, but that was the better way, right? That was your way. He goes, yeah, but there were some bumps over there. You didn't like the bombs. All right, God, all right, God, all right, God. And then we do this really silly thing. We want to retrace all our steps back to the point we made the change. So, so okay, God, I'm going to go, I'm going to live in my past for a little while. And I'm going to get back on the path. And, 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 and we, we, I just, you need to hear this. All of that is self-imposed stress. The stress is not the bumpy way when we're anchored in the place that we know we're walking with and in the direction of God and his purposes for our life. Because we can be sure in the determiner. If the God of the universe has set this trajectory, then even when it gets bumpy and upsy and downsy, I'm not worried about it. I trust the one who's defined it. The reason we get stressed out is because we self-define and then we discover the bumps that we couldn't see were gonna show up. When they show up, we go, oh, I'm making a mess of my life. And God's up and down going, I know. <laughs> I know. Why don't you just walk the way, walk where and way and how? But here's, here's the reality. For, for those of you that have never chosen Jesus, you're in this church today. You heard someone was going to be talking about stress. You're like, my life's got stress. Maybe there's a place for me there. Maybe some of you have been walking with Jesus for a while, but, but you're off on the self-determined path right now. I just want to say to you, it's really, really just an amazing thing about God is his grace is sufficient for all of it. 
that you can get off the path and the Lord doesn't say, well, I hope you walk through some pain and discover how great I am. He's not like that. What he's thinking while you're walking through those hard moments is he's like the, the dad of the prodigal son. He's waiting for you to come so he can just open his arms and welcome you and say, hey, listen, we got a better way. We're gonna walk in now. And so if, you've, if, if you're in that place, you've, you've never surrendered your life to Jesus, we're gonna give you a chance to do that in just a few minutes. And we're gonna help you kind of, kind of reset it. Now, all of our walkings have consequences or circumstances that sometimes live beyond the change. And that's a different message, but sometimes we, we can unintentionally believe that once we surrender our life to Jesus, it's like a magic eraser on all the bad decisions. You know, I chose to do this, or I made this bad decision, I walked off on my own, or whatever it is, and that somehow this, this magic eraser called salvation just makes all the circumstances go away. The circumstances aren't what's dispelled. The eternal consequence of sin and death is what is dispelled. We, we don't have to live in the consequences of living forever separated from God when we surrender our life to him. And more importantly, as we learn to discover who he is and walk in his best for us, we don't create ongoingly the same kind of or scope of bad decisions and circumstances that we're now living in that make us feel like 27% of the population, the stress and weight of them are so great, I can't go on. So the first thing is, we have to learn to live from a place of clarity about God's direction for our life. Here's the second thing I want you to write down, is doing the right things, everybody say right things, relieves stress, seeking to do more things, <laughs> creates it. In other words, production isn't always productive. Look at the person beside you and say, production? Look at the person on the other side and say, isn't always productive. And I'm just telling you, I'm a productor. I married a productor. We like producting. How we roll. But, but sometimes what we've discovered is what the, what the word of God has to say about this kind of stuff and it, how it's played out in creating stress in our world, in our family's world, in my staff's world. Like we, when we seek to do more things, we can end up in a place of doing, doing more to the extent that it creates stress instead of doing the right things. Because when we're doing the right things, it's stress relieving. And sometimes we can still do a lot of things, but because they're the right things, they're not stress filled. Quantity is not always the same as quality. I love what Psalm chapter one says. It says, oh, the joys of those who do, who do not follow the advice of the wicked or stand around with sinners or join in with mockers. Look at the person beside you and say, you're not a sinner, right? The person on the other side, you're not a mocker, right? Okay. Oh, the joys. Oh, the joys of those who don't live in those places. Sit with those people. Engage in those behaviors. But they delight in the law of the Lord, meditating on it day and night. And so I'm gonna give you the uh, kind of a, a key to this, um, some, some kind of practical activities here. I think one of the things that we uh, get wrong that leads to great stress is not only our context for relationship, but our misprioritization of what's right versus what's more. And here's what I mean by that. Um, if you go and read about stress relieving behaviors, because we can all play a part in relieving stress in our life. There are things we can do and, and, and begin to do that, are, that aren't even just um, the things that we're talking about in, in getting to know God's direction for our life. It's, they're just some practical behaviors. One of them, everybody says, is exercise. And we talked a little bit about the gym earlier, that exercise is a huge stress reliever. It's one of the best things you can do to not only relieve stress, but also prevent stress from taking a toll on your body. But I, I, I have a, sometimes have a habit. I don't know if this is true of you, but, but I'll, just, I'll just tell you my weakness in this. And then if it, if it fits for you, great, is um, sometimes, and, and I would say far more often than not in my life, I have prioritized email over exercise. In other words, my first thing in the morning is not always get up and spend time with God and then take care of my, my being before I go and engage the things that bring stress into my life. Because exercise doesn't, but email does. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Right? Um, and so, so I'll prioritize the things that I think will relieve stress. In other words, I got up early. I started my day earlier. I'm going to tackle work early. I'll get to things that actually relieve stress that we know relieve stress, like exercise, later. But this thing that I think will solve my stress, I'm going to get a jump on the day. 
I'm gonna dive into work early. I'm gonna get up, get my coffee. I'm gonna dive in early. I'm gonna tackle all that, whatever. And then you get in there and there's three emails that you can't deal with and two that are like, where did that come from? Who's the idiot that wrote that one? And your whole being goes into PTSD shakeout mode. And you get so wrapped up, you never get to the place where you do the things, the right things, that actually bring you to a place of stress, so or, or freedom from stress, stress relief. And so um, one of them is exercise. So the, the Bible talks a lot about caring for our body. It's a temple of the Holy Spirit. Like it talks about, it. I just, I just want to say to you that, I, that a prioritization of right over more is spend time with God and then caring for your body before you spend time working. That means get up, get up as, as early as you need to. And I'll just tell you right now, I have never been a get up early person. Anybody else in here like, I'm not just not a get up early person. Who would, who would be honest? Okay. How many of you are like, I, I just, I'm up at four in the morning. Like that's just what I do. You're sick. You're sick people. <laughs> You're not really sick people. Unless you have a cat, then you're definitely sick people. Okay, so here's the second thing. Spend time with God, and, and, and I wanna release you of some guilt. I, I, I just, listen, I think we should spend focused and, and extended periods of time with God. I, like, I, don't, I don't mean I think it like I've got an opinion. I think the Bible makes really clear that getting alone and spending extended time with God is important for the nature of relationship with God. We can't just say Sunday mornings is our time with God any more than we can say I spend no time with my spouse except one date a week and the rest of the time I don't ever talk to her or see her whatever, as if my marriage is gonna be good if I do that. Same thing is true of our walk with God. So if we're not spending time with God, but not every bit of time we spend with God is necessarily supposed to be, has to be, required to be extended any more than every interaction I have with my wife is going to be that. Times with Janelle, sometimes just a quick text. Sometimes they're a little longer conversation. Sometimes they're dates. They vary, but it's regular. We're communicating and engaging regularly. The same thing is true of God. So I want to free you of the idea that if you miss your quiet time in the morning, that somehow God is up in heaven and he's divorced you. <laughs> he hasn't thrown you out, but he misses the time with you just like, uh, just like I miss time with Janelle or she'll miss time with me. Like I miss it. So I think our, our times with God in the morning sometimes are shorter than others. Sometimes they're longer, that we should prioritize that. And then we should take a few minutes to a lot of minutes to care for our body. Maybe that's a quick walk. Maybe it's just, just do 20 push-ups. Like just do something to, to jar your body a little bit. Put some minor stress on your being. It actually releases all kinds of uh, endorphins and other things in your body that help you improve. M improves your immune system, helps you sleep better, like all that kind of stuff. Here's the second thing is meditation. And I know that that word can be a little prickly because we as ascribe some other religions to that word. But, but it's actually a very biblical word that meditating on the, the word, the law of God day and night, Psalm chapter one, Psalms chapter one is really qu critical because everybody's gonna dwell on something. Thing. You're going to dwell on something. You're going to dwell on the work project. You're going to dwell on the offensive statement. You're going to dwell on the social media thing. You're going to dwell on something. Everybody dwells. So, so we can make some, some, some personal decisions, some consequential decisions to dwell on the things that bring centering and peace to our being. There's a, and centering, I don't mean new age centering, don't hear that, I'm saying they just, they keep us centered on the things of God, the ways of God, the word of God, the law of God, the purposes of God, the voice of God. We have to, we have to get something in us. And so I think that means not being so familiar and having so much access to the scriptures because you can see the Bible anytime you want to from it. You can Google anything you want anytime, get it on your phone and 12 other devices that can pop up on your watch. And as a result, we've forgotten to remember or internalize the scriptures. The scripture's always there, so I don't need to memorize it. And there's actually logic that has been formed around the idea of the less I try and force my brain to remember, the better off my brain will be because if I, if I can get to anything anytime, why try and put it into me because that just messes with my cognitive abilities. There's too much information. And while that, there may be truth in that from a psychological, neurological standpoint, I think it's exactly wrong related to the scriptures. I think the scriptures need to make their way into our being that they are internalized and me remembered and memorized so that they are the things that come out when hard things happen. They're the things that come out when we face a situation. Like we need to know the word of God. And so to meditate on it is, is really, really, really important because you're gonna dwell on something. You should make it the word of God. 
Psalm 17, 24 says an intelligent person. How many of you think you're intelligent? Go ahead, put your hand up. Come on, everybody's hand should go up. This is your chance to think you're intelligent right now. If you, somebody's always told you you're dumb, you don't know this is your time. Nope, I'm intelligent right now, okay? An intelligent person aims at wise action, but a fool starts off in too many directions, scattered and frayed. And so if we're, if we're going to minimize stress, we have to seek to do the right things, prioritize the right things, spend time with God, caring for our body, and then let the word of God that we read in the morning, which maybe you just read a two verses, maybe you read one chapter. It's not about, did you finish all the Bible in three weeks? It's not about that. But did I get something in me that I come back to during the day? I jotted it down on my, on my notes. I put it on the, the, the lock screen of my phone so that this day or this week, that's the verse that pop, every time I turn on my phone, that's the verse I see. Taking steps to keep the word of God and the voice of God present all the time. Here's the third thing. Uh, quickly, let me give it to you. Investing in more of what outlasts us is what relieves stress. Gathering more of what does not outlast us creates it. In other words, we need, to, we need to focus on satisfying our soul, not our stomach. In other words, the things that I lust after, that I want, that I'm hungry for, are not actually stress relievers. They're actually stress creators. We think when we get them, we will be relieved, but we actually find we aren't. But when we give ourselves and invest our, our energies, our time, our being in the things that live beyond us, it actually reduces stress in our life. It lifts a burden off of us. Here's the way it's talked about in the scriptures. Anybody ever heard the phrase, a bird in the hand is better than two in the bush? Anybody ever hear that phrase? Some, nobody, really? Like seven people? Please, come on. Anybody? Okay, thank you. All right, I thought a few more had. A bird in the hand is better than two in the bush. Listen to this, Ecclesiastes chapter four, verse six. It says, better is one handful with tranquility than two handfuls with toil and chasing after the wind. Better is what I have in my hand with peace in my soul than a chasing after and running after how to fill both hands with so much I have no more room to hold on to what God wants to do in my life or put into my life because I've run after a self-defined destiny. I've prioritized more over right and now I'm worried about getting things that make me happy now instead of putting my life, pouring my life into things that live beyond my life on earth. This is what 1 Timothy chapter 6 says. I'm going to read you several verses here. Paul writes a letter to Timothy to coach him as he leads the local church. And this is what he says. He says, yet true godliness with contentment is in itself great wealth. Godliness with contentment is in itself great wealth. After all, we brought nothing with us when we came into the world and we can't take anything with us when we leave it. So if we have enough food and clothing, let's be content. But people who long to be rich fall into temptation and are trapped by many foolish and harmful desires that plunge them into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And some people craving money have wandered from the true faith and pierced themselves with many sorrows. And here's what I wanna say. Stability financially is not evil or wrong. Ambition in and of itself is not evil or wrong, but it can become consuming. Chasing after the filling our lives with things that live only now is a stress builder. Investing our lives in things that yield eternal treasure is where we will find ourselves being relieved. It's why when we, like last week, when we had all the 12 or 13 or 14 people that got baptized here at Life's on Church last week, we hear their stories and they talk about how somebody poured their life into them. They shared the gospel with them. They met them in their hard times. They visited them in the hospital. They prayed with them. When stress in life was overwhelming, they're going through a marital hardship or their child had run away, or whatever, a hard thing. And someone met them and prayed with them and leaned into them. And they found a, a manifestation of the goodness of God, the presence of, of Jesus in their life. And they said, I just need to know that Jesus and surrender their life to him. And the person who did it, I promise you, is not stressed out because they saw someone find freedom in Christ. They're finding freedom in their own soul from the stressors of the demands of life and the aggregation of things because they're pouring their lives into something that will last for eternity. So I just, I would say to you that oftentimes we push to the edges of our life 
playing a part in, in what God wants to do because we think that we've got to give that time to doing the things that either are self-divine destiny, they're an aggregation of more, or they're simply a pursuit of the things that our, our stomach has said it wants. But if we're going to find ourselves free from stress, then I think we need to adopt what Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. See, I think our dwelling is often on the first part of all of these, these, these partnership statements. When Paul says we're pressed on every side, I think that most of us look at that and go, yeah, I'm pressed on every side by our troubles. But what if we simply drew a strike outline through all that and we simply dwelled on, we're not crushed. What if my dwelling was not on the troubles that press in, but on the fact that it hasn't crushed me? I am not destroyed. We're perplexed. Nope, strike that out. I'm not given to despair. What if we claimed the other side? Paul says, here's the stressor. Here's the difficulty. Here's the hardship. But my life is not destroyed. I am not given to despair. I will not wallow in my pain. Though I'm not down, I'll get back up. There is nothing that is going to come against me that will keep me from giving my life fully to what God has directed for me, to aggregating the things he's put his hands to, to not living for the accumulation of stuff. For the Lord has said, if I will seek him first and his righteousness, then all of these things will be added to me. I don't got to worry about food or clothing or anything else. The Lord takes care of it all. I am not going to let the circumstances around me dissuade me from the certainty of the, the way I'm walking, the direction I'm walking in, the voice of the one who's leading and what he's called me to give my life to. So if you want to know if God can help you with stress, God will help you with stress but the first thing that God says is you have to come and get to know me enough to know the pathway you have to know where to walk you can't just try and aggregate your own little theology I like these verses but I don't know about those verses I think I like that part of Jesus I don't like this part of Jesus I like that Jesus make it all pretty but I don't like to take up my cross and follow if you want to find God ministering in the midst of stress we have to press into who he is so we can discover the pathway. We have to put priorities in the way that we execute our daily condition, which are biblical. And then we have to seek for, to live our lives for the purpose of eternal treasure, not for the sake of, of natural earth and treasure, where, ro where must, rust and moths eat away and destroy it. And so today, I'm gonna do two things. I want you to stand up right where you are, and we're gonna pray together. I wanna invite our prayer partners to come right down front here. If you're one of our prayer partners, just make your way right down here, right there. Go ahead. And um, here's what I'd like you to do. While they're coming down here, if there's a, if there's a, a, a stress has been overwhelming to you, like if this has just been a big deal for you, while we're singing this last song, while we're praying, I want you to make your way right down here. We're just going to let you get some prayer for what, whatever is overwhelming you. Decision making, a direction for your life, a, a, a faith issue, a, a consumed by wealth instead of eternal treasure. Like whatever it is. And let's, let's join together. And all right, would you just bow your heads and close your eyes right now? Turn your palms toward heaven. And if you need prayer, I want to invite you to go ahead and make your way down here. Don't be afraid. It's okay. We all need prayer. So just make your way down. Father God, we come to you in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, I thank you for all of the ways that your word helps us grow to not only be more like you, but walk in what Jesus said, abundant life, the full measure of what you have for us, God, that we don't have to be consumed by the natural or the circumstances of the moment, but God, the stressors of our day can be subject to both the name of Jesus and the ways of Christ. And so today, God, we just ask you to, 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 to kind of break the, the places and the habits and the systems that we've allowed to take root that are not your best, they're not what's right, and they're not what's eternal. God, help us to move into those places that we can feel freedom from stress, freedom from difficulty, freedom from hardship, God, that you would minister to us in all of those ways in Jesus' name. Now, while your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed, if you've never said yes to Jesus, I'm going to count to three. And I'm going to invite you to put your hand up real high. You can't walk in the ways of God if you've never come to know Him personally. we got to start there. 